The word ego has two meanings. There's the ego that's bad, that is selfish, self-centered, cares nothing about other people. And then there's the ego that's a necessary function of the mind, which negotiates between your desires and the things you pick up from society around you to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. If you didn't have this second ego, either you'd be totally a slave to your desires, or you'd be a person with no independent will at all. The trick is learning how to educate this second ego so that it negotiates well, because that which things you really should listen to from outside. And which desires inside are the ones that you can give in to, and which are the ones that you can't. And the training in meditation, in fact, the whole training that the Buddha offers is, a, is an education for this second kind of ego. On the one hand, with, in terms of the shoulds, I passage we chanted from the Dhammajaka just now, which was the actual wheel of the Dharma. Talked about the Four Noble Truths and the three levels of knowledge for each truth. In the time of the Buddha, a wheel was like a table nowadays where you have different sets of variables and you run them through their various combinations. In those days, they didn't have diagrams to make them look like tables. And the image they had in mind was that you just ran around all the spokes. This is where a Dharma wheel has twelve spokes, four times three. In each case, there's the knowledge of the truth, and then there's the knowledge of what the duty should be with regard to that truth. And then third level of knowledge is the realization at awakening that that particular duty has been completed. And so what are the Buddha's shoulds? You should comprehend suffering. You should abandon its cause. You should realize its cessation, and you should develop the path to its cessation. Now, those are all duties that are for the sake of your happiness. There are other duties out there that society would like to impose on you, some of which are for your best interests and some of which are not. But the Buddha's is the friendliest list of all, taking your true happiness seriously. Again, he's not imposing these shoulds on you, but he says, if you want true happiness, this is what you should do. So when suffering comes up, you don't just push it away. You try to strengthen the mind enough, in other words, you develop the path, so you can comprehend the suffering. What is this suffering? Why do you keep going for it? Because it is something we go for. The cause for suffering is not something outside, it's inside. It's in the craving. And we can see the connection between the suffering, which the Buddha identified with clinging, and the craving that causes it, and you can abandon the cause. And that way you realize the cessation. So those are the shoulds on the one hand. Now on the other hand you have your desires, that you have to arrange through. Some of the desires are in line with the desire to find awakening. Other desires are pushing off in another direction entirely. Greed, aversion, and delusion. Sensual craving. These things are the things that push you away. Those are the ones you have to learn how to overcome. But you also, at the same time, learn how to promote the desires that would lead to true happiness. So the functions of your ego are to learn how to negotiate this whole set of desires together with those shoulds. Psychology talks about healthy ego functions, and a lot of them are relevant to the Buddhist path. To begin with, there's what they call anticipation. You see that there are dangers down the road, so you have to prepare for them. In the Buddha's vocabulary, this is heedfulness. In fact, the Buddha said heedfulness is the source of all good qualities in the mind. You realize that if you don't train your mind, the mind can create a lot of problems. It's like having a Rottweil in your house. If the Rottweil is not trained, it's going to create a lot of problems. And the second quality is altruism. 
which for Buddhists is compassion. Realizing that if your happiness depends on other people's suffering, it's not going to last. So you have to take their, their happiness into consideration, too, as you act. This is a wise ego function. Then there's suppression, realizing that when certain desires come up, you have to say no. Or certain ideas come in from outside which tell you you should do this and you should do that, and you realize these, these shoulds are not in line with the Buddha's shoulds, and they're not in line with your own well, true well-being. You have to learn how to say no to those two. But the big problems are the things coming up inside and the voices that try to justify them. You have to learn how to say no in various ways. One trick they'll usually say is, you're, you're going to give in to me anyhow, so why don't you save us both a lot of trouble and give in now. And you have to say to that voice, well, I'm not, I don't know about five minutes down the line, but right now I'm going to say, so I'm going to say no. And you begin to realize after, after a while that these urges that come on, that seem to come over in big waves, they crest. And then they subside. And if you can withstand up to the point past the crest, okay, then you've won. Because they'll threaten. They'll say, if you don't give in now, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and you're going to explode. And you say, nope. You don't believe the picture that your greed or your aversion or your delusion likes to paint about themselves. But in saying, no, you have to have some alternative source of happiness. This is where the meditation comes in. This is why we have to find an object of meditation that is pleasing to the mind, something that we feel comfortable with, something we find interesting. The breath is the standard one the Buddha gave, because the breath is the function of the body that you can work with most directly to create a sense of ease and well-being through the way you breathe, through the way you think of the breath. So you can have a sense of well-being that goes down through the legs, goes down through the arms, goes down through the torso, goes around your head, envelops the body, permeates through the body. And when you can develop that sense of ease and well-being, then when the tension comes up, say with lust or desire, greed, anger, you realize how uncomfortable these emotions are. And when you think about the long-term consequences, you realize, I don't want to go with this. It's nothing pleasant now, and it's not going to be pleasant in its outcome. So now you have an alternative source of well-being that you can go for. Because the reason we give in to these things is because they promise a quick hit of pleasure. And if you're feeling starved of pleasure, you'll go for it. As the Buddha once said, if you don't have the level of pleasure that comes from the first jhana or something better, then no matter how much you understand the drawbacks of your desires, you're still going to give in. Because the mind wants pleasure, and this is how we, we go for it. If we don't have something skillful inside as a source of pleasure, then we're going to go for whatever. So learning how to meditate is actually a healthy ego function, finding an alternative source of pleasure. And psychologists call this sublimation. In other words, you take a desire and you you're here, it's your desire for pleasure, and you turn it into something sublime. Another healthy ego function, which the psychologists don't talk too much about, is shame. Here we're talking about the healthy shame, not the shame that's the opposite of pride, it's the opposite of shamelessness. When you think of doing something that's unskillful, you think of wise people, what would they say? What would John Munn say? What would John Lee say? What would the Buddha say? And you realize that these things are beneath you. In other words, this, this kind of shame is actually a part of pride. You have your own self-esteem, and you wouldn't, wouldn't want to stoop to something that's below your level of self-regard. That too is a healthy ego function. And then there's humor. The ability to laugh at your defilements, to laugh at the shoulds that come from outside their unskillful shoulds. The Buddha doesn't talk about this too much, but there are lots of incidents 
incidences of humor in the canon, especially when they set up the rules. There's a story that tells about why the rule was set up. And many times there's an element of humor in the story when you see, oh, this is a common human foible. You can see why they had the rule. And seeing the humor in the situation actually puts you on the side of the rule. All too often when we learn about the rules, the precepts, they seem like they're being imposed. And there's a part of the mind that wants to rebel. But you can get around that rebellious part by making it laugh. Saying, yep, that is a human foible, and yes, I can see why that's not a good thing to have in the community and why I should not engage in that kind of behavior myself. There's the story of the monk who became drunk. He was a monk with psychic powers. He'd gone into a shrine one time, and the shrine had this fire-breathing naga, and he was able to subdue the fire-breathing naga and spend the night in the shrine. Word of this gets out. People are really impressed, and they want to make merit. So they go ask the monks, what's something that monks don't ordinarily get? Well, they ask the wrong monks. There's a group of misbehaving monks called the Group of Six. So the Group of Six monks say, we don't usually get hard liquor. So the next morning everybody in town has prepared a little glass of hard liquor for the monk who defeated the fire-breathing naga. But he couldn't defeat the liquor. Glass after glass after glass, he passes out at the city gate. The Buddha comes along with a couple other monks. They see him lying there, so they carry him back to the monastery. He's lying there down on, on, the, on the ground in a stupor, first with his head toward the Buddha, but as he's lying there he twists right, twists left, turns around, finally has his feet pointed right at the Buddha, which in India, as in Thailand, is a mark of disrespect. So the Buddha says to the monks, this monk here, didn't he used to be deferential and respectful to, to the Buddha? And they said, yes. Is he being deferential and respectful now? No. And before, didn't he do battle with the fire-breathing Naga? Yes. Could he do battle with a salamander now? No. Why is that? Because, he, because of the liquor he drank. So that's the reason why we have the, the rule against monks taking alcohol. So if you can learn how to laugh at your defilements, that removes a lot of their power, because they come on, they're puffed up. They try to impress you. It's like those lizards we have out there when they try to, the males try to impress the females, they do push-ups to show how strong they are, to look bigger than they are. And the defilements come on that way as well. They try to look bigger than they actually are. But if you can laugh at them, that punctures the swollen size of them, and they're a lot easier to deal with. So these are some of the negotiating strategies you can use to help with that healthy ego, the one that can negotiate between your sense of what you should do and what you want to do, so that you put the two together. You take the Buddha's shoulds as the shoulds you're trying to hold to. You should try to comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, realize its cessation and develops a path that leads to its cessation. And at the same time, use these strategies to get your wants in line with those shoulds. So you come out winning. Even the teaching on not-self is a kind of ego strategy. As the Buddha tells the monks, whatever is not really yours, let go of it. That will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. He's not saying there is no you there. There's the you there that's going to have long-term welfare and happiness. The reason it's not having that happiness right now is because it's holding on to things that are outside of its control. So you apply not-self to anything that is unskillful in the mind. That's a label that you apply. Anything that would get in the way of the healthy ego functioning. And finally, when you've developed a path to the point where it actually does lead to the cessation of suffering, that's when you can put aside the ego functioning too, because it's there for the purpose of happiness. Once ultimate happiness is found, you can put it aside. You pick it up as a tool from that point on. You don't really identify with it that much, but you see that it's a good, these are good strategies in the mind. 
because all your desires at that point are in line with the Dharma. There's not much negotiating that has to be done. But you still know enough to, when you're eating, to put food in your mouth, not somebody else's. But at that point, the, the bad kind of ego is totally gone, and the good kind of ego has done its work. And that's when you can put all your tools down. <laughs>